by from Old Guard to Vanguard book by Malik Ishmael. That's me. And you can look it up on Amazon and you can go to her Facebook as well to uh, check out the page. And how you doing, Miss Kathy, this morning? You good? I'm doing good. Okay, all right. Well, I know you have some questions for Brother Valentine. Well, before we start, I want to say that Brother Kwan is not here today. Oh, yes, yes. He had a previous engagement. Right, right. He had a previous engagement, and I know he hate, he didn't get a chance to see Brother Ali. He in Vegas. Uh, he in Vegas? Oh, man. I'm not thinking about y'all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't blame him, to be honest with you. But, uh, yeah, we look forward to a great show today. Yes, but one of the things I want to know, because you came in here all sleepy-eyed. What's going on with you? Yeah. Working. Ah, and <laughs> okay. what else? Uh, school. So, how's school enough. doing? Hard. <laughs> <laughs> he came in here nah, looking like he I, had um, slept. I just finished finals. Ah, uh, so how were they? They was, they was finals. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I work for corporate. I work okay. for a corporate company, and mm-hmm. I'm going to school. So, finals, and then it's holiday season. So the company I deal with deals with packages. So oh, okay. we're talking about like 24, like going to work, doing 12 hour shifts, then trying to study in between and then go to class, get some sleep, yeah. back and forth. So Oh, life's hard, ain't it? So that's nah. the grind. That's the grind though. <laughs> grind of success. Trump said pull your pull yourself up by your bootstrap and make America great again. He, he stole that <laughs> from Booker try- T. Washington. That's where he stole Wait, that from. Like, I just you trying to do my part. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but um, school's cool. Um, after this, I got nine credit hours left to graduate. So oh, man, classes. congrats, brother. I could have graduated this semester, but I, I'm not going to overload with like six classes. So once training. again, tell us, what is it your major? I'm a pre-law major. All right. Yeah. So I'll be able to come to you for some advice, right? Negative. Negative. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you already lost a client. This year was probably <laughs> one of the biggest interventions I ever had in my life. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, we push the school route all the time. And even though I've invested in education and all of that, uh-huh. I'm I'm really thinking about um, not investing into higher education as far as a master's or a PhD. Like I understand we need people that needs to do it, right. but I also feel like I I know what I like doing, right. and I think that um, probably media journalism or some type of platform. Like I've c- developed a whole concept and created a blueprint and i'm thinking about the best thing you could do is just invest in yourself so i'm thinking about um starting my own uh you know media thing Mm -hmm. and investing in myself and i'm learning for everybody else and i'm just kind of you know reading and looking and putting my money where my mouth is at the end of the day okay well you got a great example with uh mr mcfadden here no he's actually one of the people that inspired me to even think about doing it because i look at it like this for, since I've been in college for I've been in college now four years straight, okay. and every year, either a professor or even my 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 um my advisors they'll just sit there and talk, listen to me and they'll be like, Ali, you need a podcast or like you right. need to be on a talk radio <laughs> show mm-hmm. or like they'll tell me like when you talk people listen right. and people have been pushing me for the longest like bro you need to probably be on journalism right. and you need to probably be doing TV right. and. One of the biggest things I've learned this year is like you can't wait, you just gotta do it. Oh, yeah. And so, the the situation with the Ville where Thomas, I was talking to them about a podcast, and Thomas was like, "Well, my mom knows somebody that owns a, a station, mm-hmm. right? And, mm-hmm. You know." But that situation in the Ville was able to let me actually try it out, and I realized like, you know what, like, you know how it's like a girl, they be like, "Well, you know, you know." Right, right, yeah. but like. Right. I'm telling you, like, I know. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> you know that gut. You know now, you know right. I'm supposed to be doing this. Like, right, right. I'm supposed to be doing interviews. I'm able, I'm universal. I'm able to be in any crowd. I can talk to old elders, people that's younger than me. I could talk about going to different countries, different okay. experiences, coming from the uh, I can relate to people, and I make people feel comfortable, mm-hmm. and I have the ability to articulate it in the way that I can pull the information out and bring that emotion, mm. and that's what people want to see. Okay. And so I'm thinking, like, I'm still young, and if I learn now and I invest in myself now, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard times. It's going to be mm-hmm. pumps right. for a while, right. Right. but at the end of the day, I win at the end of the day if I do hit that lick. Right. You right. know what I mean? And I was just thinking, like, uh, it's funny because a lot of people on campus, like, who re- critique the DeVille, right. they'd be like, oh, you remind me of, like, a Charlemagne or something. I guess maybe I'll finally say something. Well, like, yeah. I, I used to watch DeVille, <laughs> and uh, I tell you, he was the, uh, I ain't going to say like, he was the something sheep, but <laughs> <laughs> 
but you was all turn up. <laughs> but I get a lot of comparisons. That's cool. I understand right. people when they don't understand something and something new, they they relate. They 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 try to put something and relate to it. Right. But it made me think like when Joe Budden or Charlemagne or Oprah, yeah. when these people retire or Angie Martinez or Funk Master Flex, when these people retire, who's gonna take their place? You got to think Angie next, Martinez next is. Yeah. In her fifties, yeah, she's almost out of here. Yeah, she's on her last leg. She's not hold even. Down, hold down, hold <laughs> on, We in that category. We, we right there. But I'm just talking about as far as the industry. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. You yeah. got to find another avenue, but this is a new game, and so what we're doing now is I realize it's a digital age. More, the difference is now yes. is like people are more into the individual person more than whatever the art is. So right, let's say right. if I'm mm-hmm. talking about an artist, the difference is back then you had like a a mystery to the artist. Right. We didn't have Instagram. We couldn't pull it up. And so you had a bond and you had a connection mm-hmm. with this artist because it was – it was mystique. It was mysterious. Right, right. Now we don't really care about the music. We care. We hear more about Kanye about his the personality, right, right? And his right. personality, yes. right. what he's than doing, we knew, than the music. And so people are willing to sit there and pay and listen right. to hear you get the truth and to his motivation. So right. I've created this whole theory and this whole situation, like you were talking about school. But I've created a whole situation where, like, I'm about to uh, start my own podcast. Okay. And I have all I, I came up with the concept, and that's what I've been waiting on. And the vibe, it's all about the energy, right. it's the setting. Right. I want to make people feel comfortable. I want it to be an environment where that guest can be comfortable to do what he, as he or she pleases. Right. I want right. it to be an environment where mm-hmm. musicians, artists, like I got a list of like a top ten of like different type of people I want to even interview. Like okay. I want to interview an astronaut. Oh wow! Okay, all right, all right. That's cool. Yeah, but like, that's cool. you know what I mean? Yeah, Something yeah. like that. But like, I got a black pilot. You know, I know y'all gonna get into the killer mic stuff, but yeah. I, I do have a list of like different type of people in the industry as well. So, and then also, even your environment where you're at now, you have a whole lot of people around you in school. Yeah. So it's yeah. like you have minds that's there that can also help you get started. So it's like pulling in other students that yeah. those are their majors to actually work with you. So I'm actually thinking about taking the next semester off. Oh, uh, oh. Okay. Even though I got nine credit hours, mm-hmm. I've literally been going to school four years straight. Right. And I feel like time is everything, opportunity cost. Right. And so I don't need a degree to do this. <laughs> no, but, you, but you're right there. <laughs> you're right there, though. That's <laughs> not what I'm saying. That's okay. I right, understand right. that. I'm still yes. going to get the degree. Yeah. I'm not going to not finish. Right. However... I can still be building this empire now. Right, I understand that. I could be. I, I could take you. online classes for right. those last That's three what classes. I was say. Oh, okay. You see right. what I'm saying? Yes. So, but I'm just saying, as far as attending the campus, correct. I've outgrown that. Yeah, yeah, I see what mm-hmm. you're saying. I've outgrown yeah. that campus. I've networked. I've used every resources. I'm on another level now. I've got the network. The only thing college was good for that I got out of the university was the ability to learn how to network with people. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Gotcha. That's it. Yeah. So now I'm networking, and that's what it's about. The cla- the world is my classroom now. I don't really need Georgia State. Okay, I got you. But what? in the meantime, right. since you spent so much money, the thing about it is just like any other parent that would be out there, finish and get that degree because you only have nine left. And like you're, you're saying, right. you can take it online. I don't care if you're taking one and finishing it up, but part of it, you also in the world of paper. People want to see that degree. They put that down now as some of the minimum requirements. And what happens is that'll hold you from getting something sometimes Mm -hmm. when the only thing you needed was to show a piece of paper. So if we're in that environment as well, you got to realize that's part of the game. You got to play the game to be in it. And and see, the great thing is a lot of people forget, too. Mm -hmm. I'm a veteran. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Post 9-11, I'm graduated. The difference is I learned the game without having to take that hit, Mm -hmm. that $40,000, $50,000 hit. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's why it's like at the end of the day, I could jump back in and out. Right. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. I'm just taking a break to learn a little bit something else so I can focus and be the best at it. And then I'm coming right back. As long yeah, as you say it's a break, because I'm going to be on you and I'm going to be watching. Well, speaking of break, All right. uh, <laughs> I, I tell y'all to get y'all popcorn ready, whether you got it in the pantry or on top of the uh, refrigerator, as Michael says. So uh, we'll be right back with the Vanguard on Power 108.9. All right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Y'all both right, but this is what I've realized. I'm in a position. 
position where I can play either or. Or Honestly, play both. If I want to go corporate, that's what I'm doing. But yeah. I'm only doing this corporate job to make that money to invest in myself. Mm-hmm. So I understand I gotta look clean cut. I gotta look a certain way, and I also understand the difference between what I'm qualified. Yeah. Just having that extra gives me that extra. But that's why I say going to masters and PhD doesn't matter because there's people that's working with me now that has master's degrees. And I'm making just as much as them, and that's because I'm a veteran, got leadership skills. I didn't have to go through all that bullshit. So what I'm saying is, yeah, I'm gonna finish these three classes. I'm gonna get it, so I gotta finesse it. I'm waiting on But the, the, the overall goal is, bro, I've learned four years of college. What I learned is the difference between education and school. We can talk about it. Oh yeah. yeah. And but also experience. Schooling, yes, experience you don't need yourself. schooling. Schooling is a. That's why they call it the school of thought, man. School is just to teach you. To, that's it's why true. I think sometimes yeah. even even with like with the bill. They came up in the community. They have a collegiate background. I don't. And so I point of view, and I have this life experience. Right. They don't. They're reading from a textbook. Right. So sometimes it's a misunderstanding. Well, see, I'm just saying, because you grew up in South Central. But that's right. I know that. I know that. You want the same goal, but yeah. it's different. That's why I say you have that vote. Because if you have vote, you can play the game. Well, see, that's why I'm just stupid. It says by the <laughs> two. <laughs> Late in the game, and it's too late. <laughs> yeah, I want to kick back up on that conversation when we come back a little bit more before we dive into uh, the icon. No, no, no. Oh, you better. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. We're back with the Vanguard on Power, 108.9. And before we get back into the conversation, I definitely want to pick on um, what we were talking about during the break as well. But I want to give a shout out to Jack Jackson uh, over in New Jersey. He has a uh, toy giveaway uh, this holiday season. You know, whether whatever your views are of uh, holidays. holidays, Christmas, or whatever the case may be, he uh, has continuous programs throughout the year. And you can definitely follow him on Instagram at Jack. Jackson 81. So uh, definitely uh, check out his Instagram page and see some of the programs. Now, we were having a spirited conversation during the uh, break, and I want to kind of pick back up on that. Uh, yes, we were still talking about and debating on as long as he's finished at school, I told him I'm good with him. So tell me, you said you would, right? Right, right, right. I will, but like <laughs> just to kind of go and dive into what we're talking about, because this is a debate and a conversation mm-hmm. that's going on. Right. Even at family, like I uh, said, Thanksgiving, we were just having this debate with some elders. Okay. The older generation, and it has taught us that to be successful in this country and in this nation, that we need college and we need schooling. Right. And so they push schooling on us. And what has happened now is now that we're all in debt. And a lot of the times is yeah, that's true. they don't care about these degrees. They don't even care what you got a degree in. Mm-hmm. Like I said, a lot of these people now in this society in this time, we don't need you don't need a degree. You can learn how to market yourself. We have the internet now. We have technology, yeah, and true. this is a different ball game. Right. And so 
you're right. And if you're playing a corporate role, there's a difference between being certified and qualified. You know what I mean? Right. It's just like the dude in the neighborhood who's been fixing cars for 20 years, he's qualified. Everybody mm-hmm. takes their car to him. That's true. He can get a job at the shop. He'll be working, probably starting off $20 an hour. Right. But that kid that went to school and learned the mechanics and got a certificate, right. he's going to be able to negotiate and have that forty, sixty thousand. 60000 right. So it all depends on what type of game you're playing. Are you mm-hmm. going to play the corporate America role right. or... You're going to do what some of us are doing, and that's betting on ourselves. And that's mm. what a lot of these millionaires and these billionaires did. Right. They betted on themselves. And, um, you know, I study globalization, and one of the things about what makes a nation, a sovereign nation, is borders. But with globalization, the Internet has destroyed that. Right. There is no more borders. Mm-hmm. I can link up with somebody in Japan, New York, Brooklyn, whatever, FaceTime, and, and right. we can make something happen. So the old school way of doing things is like totally out. Don't get it wrong. Right. There's right. a difference between education and school. Education is knowledge. That's the foundation mm-hmm. of everything. That's Looking, true. learning, knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Right. However, um, schooling... Schooling is just a way to teach you how to think. Right. Like, mm-hmm. we could take one student from Georgia State University. It's a proven fact that 70% of the students at Georgia State University are liberal. Right. That's including the staff. Right. When we take a student that went to University of Georgia, right, which mm-hmm. is already pr- proven to be 80-something percent predominantly conservative. Right. And we take both of those students who went through the same uh, political science class. They're going to give you totally two different answers, and I guarantee you they both pass the class. It's because the professor who teaches the class, and that's a problem with the schooling too. Right, right. Students are just regurgitating the information that they're hearing. Right. You're not learning anything. It, it's funny to me, like, I read books from, like, the 30s and the 40s, like Ralph Ellison, and even this book, this new book I just read, Napoleon Hill, that came out in 1937. We're still talking about the same, sh- excuse my French, but, like, we're talking about the same shit in 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because we're regurgitating everything. Right. Nobody's taking the information. It's called adding on. You're supposed to, that's why the professor tells you, read this, the, the information before anyone will come to class and have a discussion mm-hmm. about it. Right, right. You read the information, you take your own thoughts, your own experiences, and, and you take what they say, and then you come up with your own thought, idea of thought. Right. And so that's why I want to do podcasting, and that's why I, I want to do like multimedia. Mm-hmm. I want to challenge people to think. Mm. There I want to challenge critical thinking, and I want to inspire people by thought. Right. The whole idea, I think, therefore I am, it's like, it's so simple, but it's so, it's the fact. The fact that you can think right. and you can see it. Well, creative thinking is so important. Be able mm-hmm. to think for yourself. You have the information, and to be able to articulate it, to be able to uh, justify it in terms mm-hmm. of your perspective. And we live in an era now where information is power. You know, I mean, we go from... Uh, if used right. If used right, right, exactly. And, if used right. And, uh, you know, we have a... Just like we're here at Power 108.9. Thing is, who listens to a radio, regular radio station, uh, except for their car or yes. somewhere else? It's like with this format that, that Michael has created here at Power 108.9 and online and what have you, you can see the replays, you can see the live. You same can, traditional. Same traditional. Format yeah. radio, the difference is now that the consumer has direct access. Yeah. Correct. There is no more middle man. Right. And, and so. And it's live, yeah. direct, immediate, right. repetition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, uh, back to the uh, interview thing in terms of uh, your recent interview with Killer Mike. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us about how that came about and what was uh, talked about. I did see it myself as Proper well. preparation prevents poor performance. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so what is success? <laughs> Somebody used to always tell me success is when preparation meets opportunity. That's what success is. Okay. And so what happened was I was in a situation where, you know, like you were saying, the school network right. where they have, he's on a college tour. And so the people that he was doing, having him up there, I knew them. Mm-hmm. So uh, I got myself on the VIP list. There you go. <laughs> there it is. Opportunity, baby. <laughs> but what I did was... I use this platform in a sense of Check. like networking myself. So what I did was I had somebody take highlights of all my moments from mm. all the bill, okay, and create like like a highlight reel. Oh man, kind of like you wow. ever see like people do like yes. the yeah. funniest moments of the week yeah. of somebody's <laughs> show, or even like the football players doing right. their highlights. Right. Like I said, apparently people like authenticity, so I gave it to them, and so I have like a little clip of like okay. just different moments from the show with me on there. Right. And so I pretty much walked up to him and I was just like, "Look, you always talking about have something first, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I got it right here. I can show you." Mm-hmm. And he was just like, 
you want to do a show with me? I <laughs> All right. Here. I was like, yeah. <laughs> opportunity. And opportunity. he was just like, hey, he got his, um, his publicist, and he was just like, book it. Okay. So we did that. But what I want to do first is I feel like um, – I want to build a story behind it. Everybody thinks everything looks so easy, right? And people don't know the backstory. Like, people may see, like if I, I if the, like if, even if something was to blow up tomorrow, or the artist to blow up tomorrow, they think that's just like overnight success. Correct. They don't know the 10, 15, 20 years. I'm sure this isn't the first endeavor he's in pursued in. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm sure he's probably been grinding Definitely. for years, but nobody has seen that. Right. So. Before people, like I told you, before people buy into a name, they need to buy into the person. Mm. So mm-hmm. I want to build my concept first, and then I'm going to put it out. That's going to be something that's like, you know what I mean? Right, right. It's Every, almost like it's going to be a buzz in the air. Right. Like something's right. coming. Like, right. I understand and the power of control. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I control the content, and that's the right. great thing I want. I want control. Yes. That's the goal of my life. Like, that's what's motivating me. Like, power. Right. But power is control, and if I have more control of what I, of my life, then I have more peace in my life. And right. I have more mm-hmm. peace, then I can, I can relax a little bit more because I know my mother's straight or you whatever is taken care of. I but I gotta have control. Right. Mm-hmm. And only way you can have control is you have to negotiate those those terms, or, or and, and to negotiate you gotta have, um, you gotta have the tools and things, the leverage to negotiate it. So right. I'm building. A network, and so I came up with an idea. Like at first, I was gonna call this podcast the Blueprint. Okay, all right. Because I, I thought like everybody, you know, has a way to like you know tell their story, and I mm-hmm. wanted to pull different people's story out. But what I realized is everybody's story is just the story of a human being, and so right. I came up with this concept and what it's gonna be called, and it's gonna come out and start in January. Okay. But it's called the String Theory. Okay. And I don't know if y'all familiar with the String Theory. No, explain. No, that. go ahead. Um. Quantum physics or okay. quantum mechanics. It's right. so an idea that came out by Einstein, but to sum it up, it breaks down physics and atoms, and it's one of the most complex things in mathematics to explain. But pretty much one of the things in string theory is that there's different dimensions based off because space is time. Right, mm-hmm. right. And time so he's time. saying that b- within this time, there's different dimensions, and so there's different personalities of different type of people. And within different settings, there's different you. Right. And so a lot of people always talk about what they would do if they're in a situ uh, until they're in that situation. Right. And so with this platform, I want to be able to show the complexity of human beings and put you in their shoes so that you can understand real life experiences. Right. Like people will talk about people who sell drugs and be like, I don't understand it, but you it's, you it's you don't understand it unless you've been in the situation. Correct. Where that's the only exactly. thing. So I have to put you in that different dimension. Right. So th- it's the string theory. Wow. And I know uh, science. Well, it sounds like you know, it sounds like that you, you know you're empowering yourself to give people power. Right. That's you the know, whole. You yeah. know, because power is the ability to define phenomena that in turn make it act in desired manner. Right. So you're trying to control that your, your narrative. Right. right. And, and also, I think that's very important. And also at the same time, you're educating people. Right. Exactly. Because we can look at people, and I hate to say it, because all downtown you see homeless people, right. and it's like they have to have a story to say where they are. Not just us judge them because they're on the side of the road. I was telling a, a buddy of mine, um, Gerald, we was walking down the class one day, and he bumped into me. And right there by um, the school, there's a homeless, like a lot of homeless people. Okay. But a lot of them be down there playing chess. So he seen me down there playing chess, and he was like, man, you be down there playing chess with them? Right. And I was like, bro, you can learn a lot from a Oh, fool. absolutely. You can learn a lot from a homeless person. Right. Like, don't fool you. Like, I'm sitting here playing chess, but I, I'm also learning from these people. Mm-hmm. He was like, man, that's humility, bro. Right. Like, like, that's dope. But right. yes. people don't understand. You can learn from anybody. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting you bring up that point because when I lived in Los Angeles, particularly Carson, I, you know, I lived in a lot of places. But I used to take the bus from Carson to downtown L.A. Mm-hmm. over to LACC. Mm-hmm. And I would actually have some deep conversations with people who just happened to be homeless, mm-hmm. extraordinarily intelligent. And, you know, s- some had some issues, obviously. Right. But thing is, uh, I had some deep conversations, man. It was just about people. And, and sometimes people are in a are put in a position because of circumstances or whatever. I mean, the case talking be. to, like, one of my closest friends, she just moved back to Long Beach from um, Seattle, mm-hmm. and she was telling me about, like, the homeless crisis in L.A. She was downtown, yeah. and she's mm-hmm. just like, yo, rent's too affordable. Yeah. It's not affordable. Um, it's too expensive. Um, it's becoming even more harder. The, the job demand is it's, it's becoming harder. The market is harder. Right. Um, and right now we're the Black Hollywood. Everybody's moving here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And, and that's yeah. another reason I'm like, 
you know, I want to explore different avenues because, like, one of the greatest things, I, 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 everything is about timing. Right. But I don't think it's a coincidence that I turned down going to UNLV to come back to Atlanta. Mm. I don't think it's a coincidence that right after the time I'm about to graduate, Tyler Perry just opened up one of the biggest studios yes. of all time. Yeah. Like, right now, like, Atlanta is going through what I call, like, the Harlem Renaissance. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say. Yeah, in a way it is. We're it going is. through, like, a re- I don't even right. think people are paying attention to it. I see it. Right. In the next 10, 15 years, like, like right now, we're doing, like, every time you watch television, you watch those, like, your hit shows, right. at the end, you see that little peach on there. Right, right. Yes. That's, because that's true. Because the production is here. Right. Wow. All your major company, your Fortune 500 companies is coming down here. Right. Gentrification is coming down here. And the difference between a lot of different cities, and people don't want to talk about it, okay. but a lot of people who gentrify in Atlanta are black people. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> they, they, they gentrify it with black wealth. And right. So if we're talking about elitists and we talk about what L.A. was, right. like, it's crazy, but I used to hear stories about people saying, "Yo, I moved to L.A. in a trunk, like, with just my clothes in my trunk, go right. to L.A. to, you know, make it out there to become an actor. I run into people here all the time that have no family here. It's like, yo, I wanted to be an actor. I want to be a rapper. I drove right. down here to Atlanta, and I'm out here making it. Mm-hmm. It's Coming like, to a dream. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is yeah. the black mecca. Like, wow. this is, this, we're going through uh, Atlanta Renaissance right now. And so if you're paying attention to what's going on, it's like, I'm seeing this this media thing as a way to market myself as a personality. Right. And potentially, you know, modeling. Potentially, yeah. you know, acting. Right. Potentially okay. creating a real brand. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. With my name and, and, and potentially leaving something here generationally for my family. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, that's what's up, man. And see, all those yeah. different yeah. ideas and different things you want to do leads us into mm-hmm. Paul Robinson. Yeah, do you well, know yeah. his story? <laughs> he actually did go through the same transformation oh, into tre- different areas, thing. creating different characters, and also different career paths. So y'all can branch up on that and kind of tell me a little bit about what you know about Paul Robeson and the different areas that he worked into. Okay, and I did have one last question with uh, Brother Ali. It's is about the event, the South African event. Just uh, what was going on there? Because you guys oh, were just... Oh, the yeah. South African yeah. Dallas. So, yeah, well, yeah. you know, during the whole fight for apartheid in right. South Africa, you know, if, so people who don't know what apartheid is, just think of like Jim Crow or the black laws here. Right. Um, black Americans, uh, black people that is dark have been oppressed all over the world, no matter what country, nation, or wherever they speak. So that's why it's like kind of ignorant to separate us because we all in the same struggle. Mm-hmm. Right. But Absolutely. in South Africa, they went through apartheid and uh, just kind of like it's funny because the, our main, our strongest revolutionaries are women. Yes, absolutely. And so <laughs> it kind of mimicked what was going on in South, uh, here in, um, in California when like 70% of the leadership of the Black Panther Party was led mm-hmm. by women. That's right. A lot of the men were in situations where they couldn't fight and the women stood up. And yep. so in South Africa, they had Women's Day, Women's mm-hmm. Day. Right. And it's a day just to honor their women okay. and all their women that fought. You know, like, for example, like our Harriet Tubman. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Our Coretta Scotts and our Asada Shakur. Right, right. I'm going to throw her in there, too, and oh, like absolutely. Angela Davis. Mm-hmm. And so, like, it was a day where I got to network and um, meet people from that diaspora, but at the same time um, sit back and just appreciate the black women in our world, like, in our nation, because... Like, I don't think we realize how important black women are. Like, oh, I, I don't Absolutely. think we really, like, I know people say they love black women, but I right. don't think they really understand, like, how valuable black women. She's the first nurturer. She's the first teacher. She's the first protector. Right. My mm. mother would do anything mm. for me. Wow. Nobody loves, like, you can't measure the love right. a mother has for her child. The nurturing. The yeah, yeah, like, like to yeah. think about it, like, as a man, like, I understand why women get so upset because we put all our frustrations and everything on the, the woman, and like right. she has to carry your your baggage, yeah, our children's burden. baggage, right, <laughs> the second shift. So it's just like I got to sit back and rest, really, really reflect and really reflect on my humanity and like accept, like okay, yeah. I do benefit from being a man. All Thank right. You. <laughs> and, look, and you know how you do say that everybody has their story. So for me, that love that you feel right. is not quite the same on my side. Really? Because my dad raised me. Right. And so pretty much he raised four kids. He was our mom and our dad. Right. And that was the strongest black man that I ever knew That's was dope. my dad. And I, now that mother nature part, now I would do anything, me and the rest of my siblings, mm-hmm. for my dad. 
anything. He say somebody was right there getting on him, he wouldn't tell us because he knew we were all on mm, them. Right. But the thing about it is, he was the one that nurtured us just like a woman did. Thing about it is, I think we're even stronger because he was the man that did the nurturing. Because I think not only like a woman, but also like a man. Mm. My feelings get tucked when they need to, to be as strong as I need to be. And just think about it. He had three jobs. And he four did, kids. Uh, he, he, he took care of the hair issues with the girls. Yes. Hooked up the uh, boy. We kicked never the, went the breakfast. hungry. Yeah. He actually created his own garden. We could go out in the backyard to grab whatever we needed when he wasn't there. One of us was six months old. That was my younger sister. I was three. My brother was five. And my sister was seven. He raised us with three jobs, so you can't say a man can't take care of kids either. Look here, I told y'all to get y'all popcorn ready. Uh, we're just getting started. We're going to uh, get off into the uh, icons, and we're talking about uh, Paul Robeson, Eldridge Cleaver, and uh, my man, um, who was it? Uh, Paul Robeson, Eldridge Cleaver, and Robert Williams. Yes, it Negroes is. with guns. So we're going to get into that conversation when we come back with the Vanguard on here. Power 108.9. This is your new favorite internet radio, Power 108.9. You want to answer that, don't you? I bet it's just killing you seeing the soft glow just inches away. Someone wants to tell you something or ask you something. Oh, come on, answer it already. Just so we're clear. That wasn't my fault. Next time, ignore your inner voice. Don't text and drive. Stay up on what's happening here at Power. We've got new shows, new guests, and new events that help us connect with the community. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Power 108.9. You can also go to Power1089.com to get all of the updated news and happenings here at Power. Thanks for listening. At the same time, I've been my feelings hurt so bad that I don't even want to eat. Wow, <laughs> that's never stopped me though. I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't even want to eat. But I'm just saying, wow. like a woman because she she sees it in me, she has to be there. And she has to be there. She has to be there. Yo, it's Michael McFadden for our friends over at Credit Building Professionals. You know what they do? They help their clients achieve better credit. How? Late payments, fraud, liens, charge-offs, student loans, they do it all. Get results in 30 to 90 days, and it's very simple to contact them. Hit them up on their website, creditbuildingprofessionals.com, or give them a call, 678 678- Four four seven two zero one two. Once again, six seven eight four four seven two zero one two. Tell them you heard it on Power One Hundred Eight Point Nine. What up, Credit Credit? If you're a content creator, social media socialite, influencer, or simply love to record current events, you need the joystick. The joystick is an essential tool for every type of digital content creator. It holds two or more mobile phones or tablets allowing users to stream and record hands-free on multiple apps simultaneously. And it's lightweight and portable. For more information or to purchase your joystick today, visit our website at www.joystick.com. Okay. We're back with the Vanguard on Power 108.9, having some stimulating conversation with uh, Brother Ali. And I'll advertise when I say this is the return of Ali. There so, you go. <laughs> so 
So uh, I also, before I, I kick it over to Kathy as well, I want to give a shout out to Community Services Unlimited uh, and its director, uh, Neelam Sharma. Uh, the Community Services Unlimited actually was the nonprofit arm of the Southern California chapter of the Black Panther Party. That's dope. And that's the era from 77 to about 82. And then the Panther Vanguard movement from 94 to 2001. And uh, it's despite the demise of both those organizations, uh, Community Services Unlimited never stopped. Mm -hmm. And they actually have a Paul Robertson Community Center in which they teach classes on capoeira, which is, you know, the African, uh, uh, Brazilian uh, influence uh, uh, martial arts. Uh, they have the uh, uh, holistic uh, gardening, uh, things of that sort. And that's why I want to kind of lead into about Paul Robeson. What, what's your information in terms of what you know about Paul Robeson? So to be honest with you, uh -huh. I don't know much about him. So okay. I intentionally right. didn't do anything, okay. uh, did no research on it because I wanted to be in a position there where like, I can actually really learn. Oh, okay. Well, he actually, <laughs> to me, you know, I actually... I'm honest. You're right, right. No, but that's good. You're right, right. I actually want to learn, so I didn't do no research. I didn't even look at one little thing. Oh, okay. Well, All right, so you go ahead and hit us with your Paul Well, just, just from Paul Robeson, uh, in terms of his history, he's probably, well, not even arguably, he is the greatest Renaissance man of the 20th century. Okay. Uh, number one, he was a, uh actor, director, singer, uh, linguist. Uh, he could speak 30 languages. Uh, he was known all over the world. Uh, there's a book that was put out by his uh, granddaughter, uh, Susan Robeson, called The Whole World in His Hands. And so the thing is, this man was so big. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when uh, he, he was born in like 1898 uh, in New Jersey, pa uh, I think it's Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, he was one of four kids. And uh, his mother ended up dying tragically. Uh, and so the thing is, he was raised by his father, who happened to be. Uh, you know, uh, he was he grew up pretty much as uh, enslaved African, mm -hmm. you know, and so this brother actually, uh, you know, he uh, went on to Rutgers University. He became the valedictorian. There were only three blacks uh, that ever went to that school, and he was the third. And he also and pa played sports. Yeah, yeah, he was actually the first black All American football player, two time All American. Oh, that's crazy. He yeah, as a defensive sports. end, and of course, <laughs> so, you know, back in that day, athlete. Yeah, and uh, academia. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so. and so he he was uh, really someone uh, that uh, was before his time. Uh, again, he was a uh, two time football All American. He was valedictorian of his graduating class. He went to Columbia Law School. Mm -hmm. He uh, had some issues with uh, you know some of the. Uh, racism, uh, obviously, in, uh, once in he got time. into that field. So he said, well, his, his uh, eventual wife, uh, Eslan de Good, ended up uh, saying, well, why don't you just uh, act or sing and what have you. So he was a well, singer. He was an actor. Yes. It's always yeah. the woman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like you <he was> said. <laughs> and so, so he did so many uh, great things. And, uh, I mean, he's been in movies like uh, Emperor Jones, uh, Sanders of the River. If you Google some of that, You'll see how big uh, a icon did uh, he Paul ever Robeson attain was. his law degree? Yes, he actually did. Uh, yeah. he did. and he was practicing for a minute. Yes. Yeah, for a minute, but he uh, got kind of you know disencouraged uh, mm -hmm. by a lot of the racism. He I had think to that's how with. I feel with yeah. like the whole thing. That's how I'm like I'm about to invest in myself, but oh. I think that's where I'm at with it. Right. It's kind of like uh, what James Bowen said. It's like. You know, the more conscious, you know, a black old man becomes aware, the more angry he is, like the state of anger. Oh, oh yeah. It's just like, mm -hmm. I'm like, and you so use that anger to get you where you want to be. Right. And and matter of fact, there's uh, I know schools in New York uh, that are named after him. But, you know, mm -hmm. I think he's someone that even at your level, the college level or high school or even junior high, people need to need, need, need to know more about Paul Robeson because he was a giant. He was an icon. And, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to definitely look into him. Uh, and, you know, they got YouTube videos of him talking. He was, matter of fact, he was, uh, uh, he actually went to the U.N. Before, remember when Malcolm was talking about going to the mm -hmm. U.N., talking about getting petitioned to charge the United States for or a treatment. He did it before him? He did it before him and actually got it done. You know, of course, Michael didn't have the time uh, to, uh, in terms of living, mm -hmm. uh, you know, since he was assassinated. But he actually produced the petition to the U.N., which Austria was controlled by five member nations, so, so you know wouldn't have crazy, right? <laughs> um, my professor did bring him up before in one of my classes. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. I felt so bad, Dr. Burnett, gonna be like, "I did I not teach you nothing?" <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. 
Because there's so many names. There's so yeah. much different. Yeah. <laughs> it's sometimes it's hard to remember them all. Well, he's but the, that he's specific the thing. Right. Yeah, no, nah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, that specific thing, mm. that's how I remember. Like, I remember him because of that. Uh, she did. So they do teach that. Okay. All right. I, okay. I don't know. Maybe I just forgot the name. But right. I'm aware of him. Oh, yeah. So yeah. one of the things he actually had gotten so popular that his ticket sales had went high up that he decided when he started looking out into the audience, he saw it was more and more rich people. Then he realized he was losing his audience base. So he actually started also performing separate and started doing some for the communities. Mm. He also was a man that was behind the workers union to yeah. actually get workers fair pay. So even the public loved him that was out in other countries that he was at. So he, he was, was on his Jimmy Hoffa? All over he was doing. <laughs> Without the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. he was a one-man show, and he right. was very strong. So I encourage people to read about yeah, him I'm as I'm well. I'm definitely going to look into So that. now when you come back, you'll be able to tell me. Oh, more. yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, I think one of the things and probably the reason why he's uh, least known is because he was uh, sympathetic to the communist movement uh, here in America. And... Uh, because of that involvement, he was put before the communist uh, scare, I think the McCarthy era. Yeah, uh, McCarthy, the Red yeah. Scare. The Red Scare, right. Majority of your black leaders during that time was put in that category oh of yeah. socialist or communism, especially if you read like Manny Marble's version of the autobiography of Malcolm X. You talk about how yeah. all the time they ask, Malcolm, are you a communist? Right. It's like, well, I read certain people. I kind of share their view. Like, yes, so. I <laughs> right. guess I am a communist. So, you know, I mean... Right, but he, but it, but, but during that era, it was yeah. Mm -hmm. But during that era, the red, uh, the red scare, scare was just mm -hmm. so overwhelming. So many black celebrities were brought before the, uh, the commission. Uh, yeah, and so a, a lot of the white people too. But um, I think um, only reason like it was only an issue is because it was white people that was getting uh, accused of stuff. I right. mean, the way they was being unlawful and breaking the laws and just. You know, sneaking mm -hmm. in with the NSA and, and going into all their information. They've been right. doing that stuff to us for years and whatever. Right. It's only an issue when it's them um, getting their rights broken. And yeah. you see, when you said that, just remind yeah. me of the apartheid yeah. and how you <laughs> were able to go in and just talk about what you did mm -hmm. and be forgiven. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yo, that's crazy mm -hmm. that I learned that in the class, like yeah. at the end. Okay. But but, that, but then I, I, I thought about it because now you just made me think about not really. I don't even know why I would even think about it because, like, America did the same thing with the Jews, the, uh, right. the Nazis. We took over 500 Nazis and uh, forgave them for their crimes and said, you're a scientist. So you're therefore they, the only question that they asked them were, are you communist? Mm. Okay. And they said, right. no, we're not communist. So they forgave them. Operation Paperclip mm. um, is who helped start um uh, uh, NASA. Oh, okay, right, the, right, right. The airplane, uh, NASA was started with Nazi... Uh, the astronaut uh, program? Yeah, yeah the right. whole... Th right. It was started by Nazi scientists. Wow. Well, I, I would we definitely... forgave them. Right. Well, I, I definitely <laughs> recommend, uh, you know, uh, people uh, definitely uh, look into what you're talking about in terms of just some of the research, because a lot mm -hmm. of us just don't know, and we don't know the reason why people are just erased from our history, because mm -hmm. he was literally erased. But thing is, uh, there's been pockets of consciousness that have kind of brought him to fruition. Even myself, I wrote an article for Rolling Out magazine called The American Renaissance Man. And thing is, that was my ode to uh, Paul Robeson because uh, when I was younger, I used to always say, well, Malcolm X this, Malcolm mm -hmm. X that. And then my father said, well, you always talk about Malcolm X. You need to learn about Paul Robeson. <laughs> because, they, because they only push those two people on us. Yeah. Yeah. They, they try to box us. Right. They, is ironic. They only push the old, the the the, the um, beginning version of Malcolm, that more radical, more yes. before his thought got more, his mm -hmm. idea got more into it, and I think that's purposely, right, right. so that that way the younger generation they'll be more stuck in that one mode, and so yeah, right. they end up putting themselves, they're tricking themselves out of the position where now they have killed somebody or mm -hmm. tried to do whatever, and so now you have a behavior issue, and we're gonna lock you up, right. and then the other idea they've got free labor, yeah. Right. <laughs> and the other mentality that they pushed is like this nonviolence and thou shalt forgive and mm -hmm. let's pray and let's forgive about it because look at the South Carolina shooting. Yeah, first thing they did was forgave them, mm -hmm. but if it was a other group of people, like look at Rosewood, right? right. When that oh happened, yes. they went and burned down the whole village. And was like we gonna mm -hmm. find who did it. So mm -hmm. it's just like we would have turned around and been like forgive you, but they wouldn't have responded in the same manner. So it's just like. Mm -hmm. I, sometimes with Malcolm X, he was used as propaganda too. 
Right. We don't just talk about it, though. <laughs> and, 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 I would love to add that I, when you when we talk about reading and doing some research outside of what we're taught in the education system, I just recently found out that uh, Dr. King's march on D.C. really wasn't the reason why he was assassinated. It had to do more with the poor people's march yeah. oh, that yes. he was organizing. And that's something yes. we never Spot never learned said, growing up in the 70s. He said yeah, that much. he said that integrating my people was like he said passing this law was like integrating my people into a burning house. Mm. He said, because now you think you're equal and you think you're just the same. And so his whole plan now was economics. He realized, okay, mm-hmm. I can get you the same house and I can get you to eat at the same thing, but it doesn't matter if y'all <laughs> going to the book, both going to school, but y'all not getting the same education. It doesn't matter right. if you're getting, you know, the mm-hmm. job, but you're poor. Right. So yeah. he was like, right. we're all poor. Oh shit, let's all come together. And you gotta remember too, the original Million Man March was Council, and we know why. If you, you do the research in oh, the yeah. NAACP and they didn't want them to come up there, and then it was like, okay, we ain't getting it. Meeting with the big six. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> At the Carlisle Hotel. Yeah. Well, you know it, it's so. sort of like telling you and bringing you right back to Atlanta. Wasn't it the Black Wall Street here that got burned down for the same reasons? So. Well, Auburn Avenue, I guess Black Wall Pretty Street, bad. Oklahoma. Yeah. 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 But, but yeah, you're right. But also, I want to segue into that in terms of self defense and self determination. Robert Williams. Now, now, uh, what's your view on him in terms of uh, a historical figure? Robert L. Williams. Here we go. Let's, let's <laughs> do it again. <laughs> well, right, well uh, get, let me say uh, Robert Williams is actually the uh, head of the Monroe, North Carolina chapter of the NAACP. But he was one of the ones, he's the only one actually, who advocated armed self-defense. That's interesting. Yeah. I'm not a, I'm historically, and I think maybe one of the reasons I don't know who he is, mm-hmm. Historically, I'm just not a fan of the NAACP. Okay, right. I, I just honestly feel like, and I'm gonna get fi- like roasted for this, but I just feel like sometimes they work against the causes of the black people. Right. And I feel like that 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 whole organization has been infiltrated from the, the beginning, and even today, a lot of the people that I meet, um, they make demands and make crying out right. but they don't follow up with anything and they only mm-hmm. usually market certain type of people like Jesse Jackson and all these type of guys mm-hmm. like they benefited from the community but it have, hasn't really helped like it's just but I have tall. to say <laughs> he, he was a little different though he wasn't your daddy's civil rights uh, right, leader probably why I haven't uh, heard of him because okay. he founded the, bl- the Black Guard which was uh, the uh, progenitor of the Deacons for Defense Okay, because you're yeah. a serviceman the thing is uh, he had many servicemen who came back from war and uh, in Monroe, North Carolina, they had, you know, uh, just like anywhere else in the South, heavy Klan activity where there was a, a point where uh, the Ku Klux Klan and, and some racist whites used to come into the community shooting up guns, yelling, and in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. Well, he organized the Black Guard, and thing is, once uh, the one night they came, he, he, he and the Black Guard actually returned fire. And so the thing is, he was a very controversial figure who had to go to Cuba. Then he went to China. Uh, he was one of the ones that was influential in what they call the kissing case. Two black boys were playing with a group of uh, white kids, male and female. They did a spin the bottle game. And one of the white girls ended up kissing the brother I've on the cheek. I've never heard of this Yes, story. yes, yes. Right here, brother. <laughs> Negroes with guns, Robert Williams and black power. Uh, California newsreels. <laughs> and I they, like guns. I'm a Second Amendment guy. Right. We're, we're just talking about that. <laughs> because the thing is, he he truly believed in the Second Amendment and uh, and the right for black people to be able to defend themselves. Yeah, I mean, well, there's no, there's been no successful revolution without guns. Right. That's in any nation we talk about. Even I'm so American. Like like I'm more American than I think some of these patriots, these white guys think. Like because I really believe in the idea of the Second Amendment. Like right. if we look at let's say let's study American history. We look at the forefathers. What they technically did was considered treason. But the right. reason the Second Amendment was created was for the militia, for the American citizens to be able to up arms and protect themselves, which eventually led to the first army in 1775. Right. You know what I'm saying? Which now led to this country. So two, like you want to see a great example of what happened happens when we take citizen guns or we take our rights away look at china look yeah. at what's going on in hong kong right now sure. they have no guns right none none right and this but the government does oh yes <laughs> absolutely and they're shooting at them and they've been right and it's been going on for months like and two it's like I, I tell people all the time like i've never seen a mass shooting in the gun range mm. okay that's, that's um because everybody yeah. got guns everybody well, got guns <laughs> it's, a, it's a deterrent right 
Harriet Tubman. I haven't seen the movie yet, so, right. but I do know historically she had a thirty eight special with her everywhere she went. Thirty eight revolver. I yes, mean, she did. Um, all our successful revolutions, even if we go into communism, like Vladimir and Lenin or um, Dessalini in the Re- uh, Haitian Revolution right. in oh, 1804. Yeah. That'd be the gun and the sword. Yeah, yeah. We, chopping. We, you needed guns. I mean, that's just the reality. Um, I learned um, this summer in my South American apartheid class, uh, they asked us, why were Western Europeans so successful? Why are they so powerful today? And so historically what we've realized is the reason that Western um, European countries were so dominant and weren't able to capture and conquer a continent like Africa is because their ability of warfare. Mm. What we've done is when we study people, the people who have the better tools Mm -hmm. and who advance better at warfare become the most dominant society. True. And so because they were able to master warfare quicker than we were and right. had the tools, they mm-hmm. got they got gunpowder from the Chinese. Right. right. They were trading, you know what I mean, rice and spices to the, the, the um to the other tribes for guns. They had never seen this before. They was amazing. They thought it was magic. Right. So guns have guns equal power, equate to power. That's true. Just reality of it. But also and determination, too, because uh, as Malcolm used to say about the Viet Cong, I mean, you had the planes dropping bombs and all that, but when you talk about a guerrilla warfare, all they had was uh, some uh, slippers, a bowl of rice, and a gun, <laughs> and, and they, they actually defeated. And North Vietnam <laughs> right. won. I mean, yeah. think about this. Every time America doesn't get the good end of the stick, we don't call it a war. We call it a conflict. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's true. It's not called the Vietnam War. It's called the Vietnam Conflict. Right, right. Or the Korean <laughs> conflict. Right, right. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Anytime we kind of like got off right, right. kick, like, oh, that wasn't a war. <laughs> well, well, just to follow up about Robert Williams, though, when you said about the guns, uh, one of the uh, things he used to protest, uh, I guess, protest about was uh, a, a public swimming pool in North Carolina that all people paid taxes, but the black community couldn't use it. And so what he did, he'd organize some protests, and uh, then he started to get a little backlash, threats. So one time he had a protest, and they left, and they got met in the middle of the street, and they had a police officer on the side. And he just watched the whole situation go down where uh, there was a, d- a mob getting ready to descend on uh, the cars that he had mm-hmm. uh, with all the kids in it. So he got out. He saw the situation. Another brother got out. The brother went to the trunk, got uh, a shotgun. He asked one of the kids, hand me a shotgun, because the mob was coming to mm-hmm. them with guns. And so what he ended up doing, uh, he, he just met them gun to gun, and the policeman was like, hey, wait a minute, what you doing with those guns? Talking to Robert Williams. He's like, hey, uh, and you know, he was basically telling him, well, you, you, you got to give me your gun. I, I ain't giving up. I'm not surrendering to no mob. Unless they give up their guns, I'm not giving up uh, my gun. And he stood right there in the police officer's face mm-hmm. and, 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 and dared him to pretty much take the gun. And a lot of people don't know how, uh, how revolutionary he was. And there was an older white man. He had to be about 80, 81, 82 years old. He started crying on the side. He said, what kind of world we live in where uh, niggas got guns and they had nothing the police officer could do about <laughs> it? He just started crying on the sideline. This was actually in the DVD, <laughs> you know. That was uh, one of the yeah, twenties and thirties. Like even yeah. when you read the story of like right. how uh, it wasn't particularly the KKK, but I forget what group it was like the KKK in the Midwest. Citizens West. Council. Oh no, okay. Uh, that was attacking um, Malcolm's family. Oh, I forgot yeah. what that group was called, but. Uh, white knights or something, something like something, something like yeah, I know what you talking about. They wore black, I believe. Right, right, right. But yeah, they were fighting him off by shooting. His mm. father would shoot the right. rifle at the them. You know, what I'm but these people, because everybody didn't live in the city, so you had towns and rural areas right. where mm-hmm. people shot and did fight back. You know what I mean? But you just didn't hear about it because it was so uh, secluded. Hold on, my man. <laughs> As we got my man Eddie in the house. What's going on, my brother? Eddie got one. Give me a pound, me a pound bro. In the world. <laughs> 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 but one last thing I definitely want to get into is Eldridge Cleaver. You and mm-hmm. I had a conversation on social media, and of course, he was a very controversial figure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I would think he was one of the greatest uh, writers of the 20th century because mm-hmm. the book Soul on Ice was very impactful for me. Uh, because like him, I was not uh, a trained uh, writer. Mm. Uh, I was someone that wasn't trained on how to put theory and uh, on paper. And how was uh, how would the influence of Eldridge Cleaver be in terms of uh, what you've uh, learned about him? Um, just as far as the um, his environment at the Panthers, right. um, and um, I've always 
I've seen interviews with him, right. and I loved how he handled himself. Right. Um, his delivery, the way he handles himself. Um, um, and two, I was just intrigued about the whole Republican thing. I just thought it was intriguing. Right. Well, he went through a, a series of uh, conversions Cause, in his cause, life. Cause yeah. if I'm not mistaken, because then he get exiled, was on the run in another country. Yeah. Like yeah. Cuba well, or well, 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 following the uh, when he. Um, I guess did an action against the Oakland Police Department. Yeah, it happened yeah. to be with Bobby, little Bobby Hutton, the first member of the Black Panther Party outside of Huey P. Newton, Bobby Seale, was murdered. Uh, but that was a couple of days after Dr. King, and I think uh, Eldridge wanted to do an offensive against the system as opposed to defense, right. which uh, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale were more in line with. And bo- little Bobby Hutton got killed. So based upon that, uh, and his, uh, he got bail at some point, and then he had the uh, had to eventually try to retur- you know pretty much re- turn himself in. So of course he didn't go, <laughs> and so he, he I guess he took a went to Canada, took a boat to Cuba, and uh, next thing you know, uh, you know he's in exile. So he was given exile not only in Cuba, but eventually the Algerian government set up set him up in uh, in Africa, you know Algeria. And they formed the International Black Panther uh, Party office. And this is prior to the split within the party. So that's why he actually was in exile. And the mm-hmm. last country I think he was in was f- Paris, France. And so uh, after a few years, uh, he decided, well, you know what? The tide in America's kind of changed. Uh, there's more information tied to his case. So he decided to and give himself up. up. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And it went uh, his way. Was that? It went his way, apparently. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. He he got out. Uh, you know, I know he had to. Good behavior. He had a strong Republican <laughs> card after that. Yeah, uh, I seen. Yeah, it, yeah. It just makes me wonder. But like, do you feel like I like? As far as his party line, like, what what's the, what you think the solution is for this? And I I asked Killer Mike that too, like, sure. because. You have a lot of black people who seem to be slaves to the Democratic Party, right? Right. And then, but then I will argue that though we may have some conservative ideas, because there's a difference between being a conservative and a Republican. Right. Um, Republicans aren't the answer either. Right. Right. But then you will have to also understand that all black people have different ideas. We all come from different places. Mm-hmm. Right. right. So, do we need a party, or do we need like a union or a coalition? I think we need a coalition. And I also believe that we need a, uh, a reassessing of philosophy. Because even Dr. King, when you really studied his life, he was moving toward uh, democratic socialism, I think. You know, he, that, that statement has been out there. Not to say he was going to be a communist or whatever right. the case may be, but uh, just forms of a, a better way of governing in terms of, uh, you know, doing more things for the people. Uh, because I truly believe to this day that we need to have free education, you need to have free health care. These are some of the basic things that I believe that the society should have. And so I think we're all creative enough to get together in a coalition and determine how we're going to get some of these things done. And I to, would yeah. take it even a step further because right. you're saying, like, oh, we should have free education. We free. They would technically say, well, public schools and all of this is free. I would right. demand quality education. There yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. it's all, all yeah. inclusive. Yeah. 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 In life. Right. Because that's the biggest thing is coming – Okay, you go, you get your education, but when you come into the, we call it the real world, it's totally different. So why not educate people right. for the world itself and the things mm-hmm. that we need? Society is changing. So right now, why not put electronics and put more of that into the schooling for the kids instead of saying, okay, we'll get these laptops for some no, kids. Right. It should be what we're transforming to is what we should be educated on. Right. So if more so now it's not sitting at work a nine to five, then do the same thing and give the opportunities that you're actually in the world of. Because right now, we still in that you got to come to work 9 to 5. Right. But R- if society is no longer 9 to 5, how do you co-mingle those two so that way we are being productive, not only people, but also the world in its own? And, and ending on that to ad- and to address that is that the type of education we have, and, mm-hmm. and because the thing is, we pretty much have dealt with a colonial education. And there's an old saying that if a people won't treat you right, how can you expect them to teach you right? Mm-hmm. Okay? So, therefore, we need a whole reassessing of our value, our mm-hmm. historical. Uh, I think that's uh, why, yeah. like, uh, not to cut you off, oh, sure, but, but like Omar Johnson's idea with this whole school, right. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, Kathy, on your note, talking about the 40 hour work week, ext- established in 1940 mm. is mm-hmm. when. The federals said that, you know, society says everybody got to work 40 hours a mm-hmm. week. It was in 1940, so definitely and time for a change. Yes, right. and we're still there today. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure having Brother 
Valentine Ali here. Uh, I told the return of Ali was going to be really good. And uh, I, I appreciate you stepping in with us, brother. And one last you. thing I want to make sure we get your information in. So can you tell us where they can follow you at? Uh, Joaquin Ali at Instagram. Joaquin Ali. On, uh, I think I'm on Twitter. Yeah, I'm on Twitter, too. Okay, right. <laughs> I really don't be on Facebook. Just, <laughs> That's don't. where I'm at. And, um, yeah, you can hit me up on there or y'all can hit them up. They know how to find me. All right. All right. All right. Well, uh, we'll check you out next time on The Vanguard on Power 108.9. Peace. 2020. 2020. Oh. <laughs>